Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Strauss and Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the rule book that the federal government must follow when making purchases. The webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We will post all the recordings on our website and YouTube channel where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. And a special thanks to our webinar partner in the series, the Small Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We'd also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded mm -hmm. organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team, and let, you can learn more about us on our website. Now we'd like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We will offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also through our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jenniferschaus.com. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speakers, Zach Prince and Dan Ramish. You can find their contact information on the screen here. And today we are covering FAR Part 19 with Dan and Zach. Thank you guys so much for your participation in the series. We're really thankful. Uh, the floor is now yours. Please let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Zach Prince. I'm here with my colleague, Dan Ramish. We're both senior associates at Smith Packard McWhorter. Uh, our practice is government contracts uh, exclusive. Pretty much uh, everything you can think of in the government contract space, uh, we handle to one extent or other. Uh, and we're here today to talk with you about FAR Part 19. It's a fairly dense topic and we don't have much time, so uh, please excuse us if we're moving fairly quickly through the materials. Uh, I'm gonna get us started. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just give a brief overview of the agenda and then an overview of the uh, of FAR Part 19 and then turn it over to Dan to discuss the particulars of the small business programs. So, and next slide. Uh, just as an overview, FAR Part 19 purpose is to provide uh, contracting opportunities for small businesses, which include various subcategories of small businesses under the socioeconomic programs, veteran-owned small businesses, hub-zoned small businesses, uh, small uh, disadvantaged businesses under the 8A program, and women-owned small businesses. The goal is to promote uh, federal uh, procurement dollars going to these various types of small businesses, including through uh, small business uh, subcontracting from large business or other than small business prime contractors uh, in most circumstances, and we're going to talk about this later on, a large business prime contractor will be required to submit a subcontracting plan that it has to in good faith comply with uh, to subcontract opportunities out to uh, small businesses. Next slide. There is a federal policy to award 23% of federal procurement dollars every year to small businesses. Uh, in the past several years, the federal government has met or exceeded those amounts, although they haven't always been successful in meeting their particular goals for the individual programs. For example, uh, in FY 2018, the last year in which data has been reported, while the federal government exceeded its goal, Overall, it didn't quite hit the goal for hub-zone small businesses or for women-owned small businesses. Uh, unfortunately, that's been a uh, historical trend. Next slide. So before we get into the small business programs, uh, it's important just to set up out, out, up front what are the potential consequences uh, if you are misusing this program, uh, and and they can be fairly onerous and it can be easy to misrepresent your size if you don't understand uh, affiliation or the ownership or control requirements or the meaning of the specific NAICS codes, which we'll talk about uh, at some uh, length here this uh, afternoon. So 
if you are misrepresenting your size status, you can be suspended or debarred from all federal contracting opportunities. There are civil penalties under the False Claims Act, uh, also penalties under various individual uh, agency statutes uh, and regulations, and there can be criminal penalties. Uh, criminal penalties are only uh, possible for knowing, knowingly making false statements or misrepresentations to influence SBA, uh, but they, they do happen and you should be aware of them. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Dan, to please discuss the general contours of the small business programs. Thanks, Zach. So, uh, what is a small business? Uh, I'm going to talk about the size standards, uh, affiliation, uh, touch on socioeconomic status, and then the limitations on subcontracting. So, small business concern is actually defined in FAR 2.101 because, of course, the term uh, is not restricted to FAR Part 19, but is referenced throughout the FAR. So, a small business concern includes affiliates. Again, we'll talk about affiliation in a minute. Uh, a concern uh, to be a small business must also be independently owned and operated, which in practice means that the firm may not be owned or controlled by a large business. The concern also cannot be dominant in the field of operation in which it is bidding on government contracts. And in practical effect, uh, SBA implements that part of the definition by setting the size standard such that no one that meets the size standard would be dominant in its field of operation. And then finally, uh, a concern must be qualified as a small business under the small business regulations in 13 CFR, uh, which we'll talk about. Those are set. Next slide. Those are set based on NAICS codes. Uh, NAICS code is a North American industry classification system. Uh, the NAICS codes uh, have or associated with a size standard that is either employee-based or revenue-based. Um, so the, the NAICS codes, again, are industry codes that are updated by OMB through its Economic Policy uh, Classification Policy Committee every five years. Uh, and the SBA sets the size standards applicable to the industry as defined by the NAICS code. And the contracting officer then assigns the NAICS code to a procurement. And it's also possible to have a NAICS appeal and protest the NAICS code that a contracting officer assigns to an individual procurement. To speak a little bit to the, the size standards, employee-based size standards, uh, based on the average number of people employed for each pay period over the preceding 12 calendar months, and that's all employees, whether full-time, part-time, or anyone else hired on any basis, and it's a head count rather than a calculation of FTE. Uh, and the revenue-based size standards are based on the company's receipts, uh, total income or gross income over the preceding five years. Uh, this actually is a change. Uh, the old rule was calculated based on a three-year average. And the, the way the new rule is being implemented, there's actually a two-year transition period now uh, where companies can decide whether to calculate their uh, uh, size based on the preceding five years or three years. Uh, Employee-based size standards uh, range from 100 employees up to 1,500 employees. Revenue-based size standards range from a uh, million dollars to certain industries. Uh, the cap is at 41 and a half million dollars uh, to still be a small business. But it really depends, uh, again, industry by industry. Next slide. Affiliation. So. Uh, Employees or gross receipts of any affiliates of a concern count in the assessment of that concern's business size uh, as a small business. Uh, the primary test is the ability or power to control uh, the concern. So another com if another company can control a concern, then they're affiliated. Uh, or if there's a third party that has the ability to control uh, both the concern and another company, uh, that can also uh, create affiliation. Uh, so it's a it's a control test, and that control can be affirmative or negative. So if another company has the ability to prevent the concern from taking certain actions, that can also create affiliation. And uh, just the power to control is sufficient to create affiliation. Doesn't actually have to be used. Next slide. So these are uh, the stated regulatory bases for affiliation. 
uh, and uh, I won't go through them in, in great detail, but of course it can be based on ownership uh, or stock options, common management, identity of interest, uh, newly organized concerns, special rules if a company hasn't been in business for very long, uh, franchise and license agreements, ostensible subcontractor totality of the circumstances. Uh, I'll just say uh, with ostensible subcontractors, that's uh, one of the uh, means of finding affiliation uh, that you have to be particularly sensitive to. Uh, under certain circumstances, if an awardee is uh, having a subcontractor perform the primary and vital function of a contract, where, for example, uh, if a large business uh, subcontracts under a program where they had previously been the prime and they continue to perform the core functions of the business, that can be the basis for affiliation under the ostensible subcontractor rule. And then the totality of the circumstances just reflects that SBA can also look at all of the facts and circumstances around a relationship between a concern and another company and find affiliation, even if they don't fit neatly into one of these boxes. Next slide. There are a couple of exceptions to the general rules around affiliation. Uh, the first one is the SBA mentor protege programs, uh, both the 8A program and the all small program. Uh, the assistance provided by the mentor to the protege under those programs cannot form the basis for affiliation under SBA rules. Then there are also circumstances where two small businesses can joint venture together uh, without having their employees or revenues aggregated for purposes of the size standards. And then there are also special rules that apply to Indian tribes, Alaska Native corporations, Native Hawaiian organizations. That's based on separate statutory authority. Next slide. So limitations on subcontracting. The concept is simple. The government, uh, when it sets aside a contract, wants to ensure that the work on the set aside is actually performed by either the small business or whatever socioeconomic classification the set aside is for. And so uh, in order to ensure that it's objective of having the work be performed by a small business or other socioeconomic classification, the, the limitation on subcontracting rule limits the amount that the awardee that has that classification can subcontract to other companies at any tier. And uh, again, this applies to specifically uh, set-asides for small businesses or other socioeconomic classifications or sole source contracts to small or other socioeconomic businesses. Uh, and there are different formulas for products mm. and services and construction. Uh, there is also an exclusion for subcontracts to similarly situated entities. So in the event that the awardee, uh, say, is a small business and they subcontract to another small business, the government says under the limitations of subcontracting that the uh, subcontracting work performed by the other small business is still meeting the goal of the set-aside. And so the similarly situated entities uh, work counts uh, as the with the prime's work as uh, rather than against the limitations on subcontracting. Now, uh, where this rule gets messy is that there are discrepancies between the FAR and the SBA rules. Uh, and of course, the FAR in significant part references the SBA rules kind of throughout FAR Part 19. Uh, but there was a, uh, a statutory change. The National Defense Authorization Act of 2013 uh, changed the methodology for calculating the limitations on subcontracting. And SBA, uh, a couple of years ago, promulgated rules to reflect the, the statutory change in the methodology. But the FAR has been lagging in adopting the methodology promulgated by SBA. So there's kind of a, a funny gap. I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit more, Zach. Sure, I was just going to interject. Uh, it, this is a really odd issue. Um, the 2013 National Defense Authorization Act changed the way that compliance with the limitation of subcontracting is calculated. Um, and the SBA changed its regs in 2016, which is already a fairly lengthy delay. Uh, and now we're in 2020 and the FAR still has not been changed. So uh, Dan's going to talk about it in a minute, but uh, this creates some very real concerns for contractors trying to determine first when they're preparing their bids, uh, what they need to comply with, and then during performance. The uh, GAO, in a protest not long after the rule changed, 
by statute uh, emphasize that uh, despite the SBA regs and the FAR saying one thing, the actual law from Congress was something else. And they, at that time, thought that was significant when cal uh, considering a contractor's compliance uh, with the limitations. Um, we have some very uh, challenging um, issues from this because you can be terminated for default for failing to comply with the limitations of subcontracting clause. Uh, we've seen instances where a contractor was told by their contracting officer that uh, they're not complying, so they're going to be terminated. Uh, we were able to convince the contracting officer that the real rule he should care about is the new one, not the old one. And in that instance, they agreed. But keep in mind, it's not just terminations. It has a potential impact on uh, the ability to be awarded a contract and potentially suspension, debarment, or false claims act concerns. So the, the most important guidance we can give is to be communicating with the government, make sure they know what you're doing and what you're complying with. Uh, so there can be no argument that you're hiding the ball. Uh, and uh, Dan's going to talk about it in a moment, but uh, this is challenging because the old rule, which is still sort of the rule, is very hard to comply with. The new rule is a lot easier to comply with in many respects, but you may need to be tracking both. Right. So. The, the FAR currently contains a clause with the old rule. Uh, so uh, companies are still receiving contracts that have the old rule in them, ostensibly, uh, even though uh, statute and SBA rules have the new rule. Now, there are a couple of agencies that have provided class deviations to implement the new rule. DOD is one of them, so that covers uh, a lot of contracts. Uh, there is a civilian agency class deviation authorization. But the only civilian agencies that have actually issued class deviations are the Department of Homeland Security and Department of Education. So uh, new contracts may have the the uh, the old FAR clause unless they're with one of these agencies. So uh, as Zach mentioned, uh, the key really is to be transparent about how you're calculating. Uh, you know. And if you're using the, the SBA rules, uh, the new rules, uh, which are now proposed for the FAR but haven't been implemented, uh, communicating that with the contracting officer and being transparent and making sure you have a common understanding about what the expectation is. Um, next slide. So uh, just to speak to that methodology, the, the percentages are the same uh, based on the old and rule calculation, uh, new rule calculations. Uh, for supplies and services, it's 50%, and the calculations are based around uh, supplies for a supply contract or services uh, for a predominantly services contract. Uh, and construction, uh, the construction formula is different uh, and allows for more subcontracting. Uh, there, the limit is 85%, and supplies and construction exclude materials in the calculation. Uh, the old rule was based around the costs incurred on personnel, uh, which, as Zach mentioned, is is difficult to figure out when you're both trying to isolate uh, the awardees' costs for personnel and then the cost for personnel subcontracted at different tiers. It gets very complicated. So the new rule is more practical, looking at the total price the government paid for performance and then limiting the uh, amount that can be subcontracted on that basis. Uh, but uh, as we say, uh, it still presents some risks uh, for contractors. Next slide. So uh, size recertification. Uh, the, the general rule is that uh, if a concern is small at the time of award, that that uh, certification holds for the duration of the contract. But there are a few exceptions to that general rule. Uh, that in circumstances where a concern has to recertify. So the first exception is a fifth year of a long-term contract, there's a merger, sale, acquisition, or innovation, or if the contracting officer requires uh, recertification for a task order under an IDIQ contract. Uh, there's also a recent proposed rule that clarifies uh, recertification in instances of multiple award contracts or MACs. So if, if there is an unrestricted MAC, uh, restricted orders on an unrestricted MAC requires recertification. Uh, 
So if the MAC itself was uh, was restricted, uh, that is, uh, if the MAC was set aside, then uh, the orders, you know, the concerns would would uh, use their uh, certification from the MAC, from the umbrella agreement. Uh, but for unrestricted MACs, uh, the new uh, proposed rule would require recertification from the orders, even without extra action by the contracting officer to require it for a task order. Next slide. Zach is going to uh, talk to us about the different socioeconomic programs in FAR Part 19. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. Um, so we, we've now talked about the general contours of the small business program. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the specific socioeconomic programs that are uh, subcomponents of the small business uh, program in general. There are a couple possibilities, a, a couple of socioeconomic programs, the, the 8A Business Development Program that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, Preference for Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Businesses, or SDVOSBs, under the SBA rules, the separate Veteran, uh, veteran Affairs uh, Preferences for uh, Veteran-Owned Small Businesses and Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Businesses under the uh, VETS First Program, uh, the Hub Zone Program, and the Women-Owned Small Business Program. Next slide, please. So first, to discuss the 8A program, uh, the 8A program was designed to promote the development of small businesses that are owned by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. Those terms are defined by regulation and they can be uh, somewhat contentious. For social disadvantage, there are presumptive categories that for the most part, are dealing with uh, an individual's uh, race or social group. Uh, and there are uh, economic disadvantages a lot easier. It focuses on uh, net worth, income, and fair market value of assets, both at the outset of the certification and uh, participation in the program and uh, setting guidelines for graduation from the program. A business cannot just form and then immediately apply for the 8A program. It's designed to promote existing businesses that are doing, uh, that are already functional, and you have to demonstrate typically two years of experience, although it is waivable in some circumstances. Uh, if you do meet the requirements, you may be able to be a part of the 8A program for up to nine years. Um, upon which time you'll, you'll graduate from the program if you haven't done so already. Next slide, please. Uh, service disabled veteran owned small businesses under the uh, SBA uh, version of this um, socioeconomic preference. It, it requires that the business be majority owned by one or more service disabled veterans. Uh, they have to manage and control daily business operations. This is a holistic analysis. The regulations give a number of factors that are going to be considered, but generally speaking, uh, if there is a review, the agency, uh, the SBA is going to look to uh, whether there's indicia of true control and management, whether the service disabled veterans have the knowledge and skills to be uh, performing in the area in which the, the business is set up. Uh, it, it can be a close call sometimes, uh, and that's why there are often contentious issues that go to SBA's uh, Office of Hearing and Appeals. This is self-certification. Uh, some of these programs require uh, pre-certification by the agency. Some permit self-certification. Uh, the SDVOSB program is specifically and exclusively self-certifying. Next slide. The VA has a similar program. It's applicable only to the VA. Uh, it's the Veterans First Contracting Program. The regulations are fairly similar to the SBA regulations. There, there used to be some divergence, but now they're much more closely aligned. Uh, unlike the SBA version, under the VA's program, you have to be approved in advance. And if you are approved in advance, then they uh, place your organization on a database, the vendor information page database, uh, to uh, let buying commands know that you are approved 
both as a veteran-owned small business and as a service-disabled veteran-owned small business, unlike the VA program, which is service-disabled veteran. Uh, next slide, please. The HUBZone program uh, doesn't get the attention that I think uh, it, it had been intended to receive initially, and that's why there have been some changes recently to hopefully encourage greater participation. It, it was created in the late 90s, intended to encourage development in economically distressed communities. HUBZone stands for Historically Underutilized Business Zones. Uh, the, to participate, a small business has to be small under the applicable NAICS code, it has to have its principal office in a hub zone, and 35% of the employees have to reside in a hub zone. It, it has historically been the least utilized category. Uh, there has been some minor growth in the past few years, and I think the government hopes that there will be more growth going forward. The regulations were recently updated to uh, permit greater utilization of this category. Uh, hub zone maps to indicate where, uh, if you are in a hub zone, are now uh, going to be updated every five years instead of annually. And there's going to be a transition period if you are, uh, your business is in a zone that's no longer a hub zone. Uh, certification requests are supposed to be processed much faster, and they can last for up to 10 years if you make certain investments in real property in the hub zone. Um, and, and now the, the time for determining status for, S, for uh, participation, that is whether you are a hub zone, uh, has been aligned with the other small business programs. That is, it's now at the time of the submission of your bid uh, before it uh, differed from the standard baseline rule applicable to the other programs. Next slide. Women-owned small businesses and economically disadvantaged women-owned small businesses are another uh, socioeconomic program. Uh, WOSB, similarly to a service disabled veteran-owned small business, uh, you have to evidence that you are small under the NAICS code and that the business is at least 51% owned and controlled by women uh, who are U.S. citizens. Um, again, this is a, a holistic analysis looking at various indicia of control and management. Uh, WOSBs, you can self-certify, but there is now uh, a third-party uh, audit uh, mechanism established so that you can be cert pre-certified. Um, more and more of our clients are taking advantage of this program. Uh, economically disadvantaged WOSBs are a subcategory of WOSB. It has a, a net worth limitation. Uh, the first, the woman's net worth has to be less than $750,000, but it excludes the interest and the concern and equity in the primary residence. Uh, this is somewhat based on rumor, but the, the scuttlebutt had always been, at least when I first heard about this program, that uh, the reason for the size of many homes in McLean was somewhat uh, to do with this limitation, that uh, the equity in the primary residence isn't counted against you. So it's a good place to uh, put money and still be able to participate in small business programs. Um, next slide, please. One of the biggest advantages of being a small business, other than exceptions from certain regulatory requirements like CAS, uh, is the ability to receive set-aside contracts or even sole source contracts. Under the rule of two, agencies have to conduct market research uh, and determine whether there are is likelihood of uh, at least two responsible small businesses submitting offers. And if so, the agency has to set aside the award for small businesses. This applies differently in certain socioeconomic categories. Uh, each has their own unique rules. We're not going to go too far into the weeds here today. Uh, but some are listed here that for follow-on 8A contracts, uh, it has to remain 8A. For WOSBs, there has to be certain determinations by the agency. There's no order of precedence among the categories. But likely, the agency is going to be keeping in mind its overall goals uh, and, and determining where it still needs to uh, award to small businesses under certain categories when determining how to set aside that particular procurement. Next slide. You can also potentially get sole source contracts uh, under the small business program. 
if even if there are fewer than two responsible sources, the agency can still award as a sole source. Their maximum uh, award limitations, depending on the category, uh, those limitations don't apply uh, uniformly. If you are an Alaska Native corporation, for example, then the size uh, restriction for uh, award as sole source is inapplicable. And these rules are very dependent, again, on the small business category. So please make sure to uh, look for your particular small business uh, if this comes up to determine whether you may be eligible for a sole source and whether you want to suggest to the customer that they ought to uh, be awarding on a sole source basis. Um, there are certain protests uh, issues that arise from uh, the sole sourcing under different categories. Uh, 8A sole source awardees, for example, can't be challenged by competitors, although they can't be challenged by SBA. Uh, and the SBA itself can initiate a challenge against the agency decision not to award sole source contracts to HubZone, SDVOSB, or women-owned small businesses. Next slide. And I'm going to turn it back over to Dan for the small business subcontracting plan. Thanks, Zach. So the federal government wants to give opportunities for participation in government contracts to small businesses. And besides just prime contract awards, subcontracting is a huge part of government contracts. And so the small business subcontracting plan is the mechanism for the federal government ensuring that small businesses get their share of subcontracts under federal government contracts. So the, the basic requirements, um, even in, in the absence of a small business subcontracting plan, there's a clause for utilization of small business concerns that says that contractors uh, receive, where uh, contractors receive awards in excess of $150,000, uh, there's a clause that says they have to provide maximum practicable opportunities to small businesses and other socioeconomic classes. Then the, the small business subcontracting plan itself comes into play for uh, large businesses uh, providing subcontracting plans if, uh, if there's a procurement in excess of $700,000 or $1.5 million uh, for a construction contract. Uh, it's also possible to trigger that limit based on a modification uh, if it increases the mod, increases the total contract value over that threshold. Next slide. So a uh, couple of exceptions, um, small businesses do not need to prepare small business subcontracting plans. Uh, there are also exceptions for personal services contracts, contracts or contract mods that will be performed outside of the United States entirely, and uh, modifications within the general scope of the contract uh, don't require small business subcontracting plans. Next slide. So. Uh, the FAR provides for different types of plans. The most common plan is the individual plan, which is contract specific and covers all periods, including options, and includes uh, goals based on the offerors, subcontracting projections. Uh, it can even include indirect costs if the awardee shows the allocation, uh, uh, then uh, the you know so, uh, contracts given to uh, provide support on indirects uh, can also be encompassed within the, the small business subcontracting plan. Uh, there are also master plans and commercial plans uh, that offer different options for uh, awardees to satisfy the requirement. Next slide. The failure to comply uh, with the small business subcontracting plan uh, is a serious matter. Uh, first and foremost, it's a material breach. If a contractor fails to comply, and the, the term used in the FAR is in good faith, uh, with the requirements of small business subcontracting uh, of the plan, and that includes the reporting requirements uh, and among other things. Uh, the government uh, can also assess liquidated damages, uh, can terminate for default, uh, give the contractor uh, negative CPARs, performance rating. Uh, misrepresentations uh, can also be the basis for false claims act action, uh, and this has been actually uh, something of a focus for uh, for uh, DOJ, and certainly something that plaintiff's lawyers have no taken note of, uh, where a prime is not subcontracting uh, as planned, and, and particularly if there's a, uh, obviously if there's a fraudulent element. Uh, so one of the, the schemes 
uh, is a, a rent event scheme where uh, a uh, veteran uh, kind of poses as a service disabled veteran known small business and the awardee uh, works with this person knowing that they aren't actually involved in running the business. So uh, there, there are risks if you don't comply in good faith with your small business subcontracting plan. There are a lot of mechanisms for the government to uh, catch up with you. Next slide. So uh, there's a, a recent SBA uh, rule that uh, defines good faith compliance. Now, this is directed by the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017, uh, and it, it gives examples of the kinds of things that uh, represent a failure to make a good faith effort. So failure to timely submit uh, subcontracting reports, failure to pay subs uh, that are small businesses promptly. Uh, if the awardee doesn't designate an employee that monitors the small business subcontracting plan, that doesn't look like good faith. Uh, failure to maintain records or otherwise demonstrate procedures for compliance. Next slide. Now, I mentioned before, uh, one of the major exceptions from affiliation is the small business mentor protege programs. And the traditional program uh, that's been around for a long time is the 8A mentor protege program. Uh, in 2016, SBA introduced an additional mentor protege program called the All Small Mentor Protege Program that's available to all small businesses uh, and businesses of whatever business classification. Uh, the purpose of these programs is uh, for the mentor to provide business development assistance to a protege that's a small business or has a different socioeconomic classification. Uh, the agreement lasts for up to, two, uh, to three years and then can be extended for an additional three years. Uh, there are limitations on the number of proteges that an individual uh, mentor can have uh, or uh, the number of uh, mentors that a protege can have. Um, and SBA kind of scrutinizes all of those uh, relationships if you have more than one uh, protege or more than one mentor uh, to ensure that there aren't conflicts between those relationships. Um, the, the SBA also takes the position that a protege can only ever have two mentors through the life of the business, even though that's not uh, fully clear in the regulations. That, that's always been SBA's view of that rule. Uh, now, there's also a new proposed rule that would roll the 8A mentor project program into the uh, all small program. Uh, so, and that's, uh, as I say, proposed, but it looks like it's going to happen and, and just for efficiency in administration. Next slide. So, uh, mentor protege agreements, uh, there are uh, rules about uh, what they must contain. Uh, essentially establishing a framework and the main thrust is to describe the assistance that the mentor is going to provide to the protege and sell, really sell it to SBA and provide it, uh, you know, detail about what that assistance is going to be. Next slide. SBA will uh, evaluate the mentor-protege relationship on an ongoing basis. There's an annual uh, business plan and, and uh, that's their reporting. Uh, looks at the, the the different assistants and evaluates whether uh, the project is actually getting something out of this relationship or whether it's just on paper. And uh, if uh, SBA doesn't uh, respond and challenge the, uh, the relationship, then that constitutes approval. Next slide. So one of the major benefits of having a mentor-project relationship is that the mentor and the protege can joint venture together and bid on and perform set aside contracts that the protege qualifies for, uh, even though, of course, the mentor would often be a large business. And the, uh, the rules provide that there's no affiliation, again, based on the assistance the mentor provides under the mentor protege program, including this uh, joint venture ability. Uh, there's also a rule that uh, referred to as the three and two rule that uh, limits the number of contracts that a JV can be awarded, uh, including under the mentor protege program. So a, a joint venture can be awarded a maximum of three contracts in a two-year period without uh, a finding of affiliation uh, of, between the members. Uh, there's now actually a proposed rule that would eliminate the three contract maximum and would just uh, set a, uh, you know, stick with the two-year duration. So however many uh, contracts the JV can win in two years, uh, 
uh, they're entitled to. Uh, and that, that'll simplify things because in practice, the three and two rule uh, gets messy because it's possible to submit extra proposals before the JV has received its third award. And so they may end up performing uh, more than three contracts, uh, even under the old rule. The new rule is a little simpler. Next slide. So uh, these are some of the requirements for a joint venture agreement. Uh, the SBA rules are very prescriptive about what a, a small, uh, all small mentor protege program joint venture needs to contain. Uh, and it essentially provides that the small business is the managing venture, venturer and is driving the bus. And the uh, project manager has to be an employee of the small business. The small business has to own 51% of the JV. Uh, profits are commensurate with the work performed, and the uh, the small business or other business classification uh, managing venturer, uh, as you say, has has to uh, really control the uh, the agreement. So um, the uh, agreement has to spell out how the small business will perform uh, the minimum amount of work, and so the uh, the small business managing venturer has to perform at least 40% of the work that the JV performs. And then that's that's in addition to the limitations on subcontracting, the joint venture has to uh, meet the limitations on subcontracting and not subcontract to other than small businesses or uh, businesses that don't have the same classification as the set aside. And But each of the requirements uh, specified in 13 CFR uh, is important and scrutinized after the fact by SBA in, in size protests. Next slide. Speaking of, uh, Zach now will tell you a little bit more about size or status protests. Hey, thanks, Dan. Uh, I know we're running fairly uh, tight on time, maybe already over, so I'm going to keep this brief uh, and just give you a very uh, general overview of size protests. Uh, Size protests are a challenge to the eligibility of an awardee to receive a contract. Um, the rules are very specific, very tightly enforced, and vary depending on the small business program. So I urge you to be aware of the rules that are applicable to uh, your particular program. Uh, you file the protest with the contracting officer, and the contracting officer then refers uh, the protest to the area office of the SBA that uh, is in charge of the uh, contract or jurisdiction over their geographic area. Uh, the contracting officer and SBA can initiate their own protests, and they are not bound by the same timeliness requirements that would bind a contractor. Uh, we have had instances where we have unfortunately uh, received the information too late to file a timely protest for the contractor, but we have convinced the contracting officer to initiate the protest on its own to protect the integrity of the procurement system. The downside of one of those types of protests is that you as the protester are no longer in the picture such that you'd receive the briefings and be able to participate as intervener. Uh, that, that would be between the contracting office, and the SBA, and the awardee, not you. You can get those filings potentially through FOIA, but it adds a level of complication that can be avoided uh, if you are uh, carefully monitoring the timeliness requirements for these filings at, at the outset. Um, you can appeal from the uh, area office's determination to the SBA OHA, Office of Hearings and Appeals, and they have a fairly developed body of uh, case law on these issues that you can turn to for guidance as well. Uh, next slide. There are a couple of typical protest grounds for a size protest. The first is the most obvious, that is the awardee exceeded the size standard under the particular NAICS code, either because just on their own they're too big or because you're aware of affiliates uh, and together with the affiliates they exceed the size standard. Uh, there could be challenges to the awardee's ability to um, comply with the non-manufacturer rule. Dan addressed this a bit earlier, that when if you are a small business that is providing a manufactured product under a set-aside contract that you do not manufacture, um, you have to comply with certain strict requirements in order to still qualify as small for that procurement. 
uh, affiliation concerns are extremely common to be protest ground. And then for the small business programs, you may have more specific challenges to the representations made uh, by the uh, awardee to the extent you're aware of them, or you may be aware that the uh, business is not actually controlled or managed by the individuals uh, that would be necessary um, in order to comply with the program requirements. Uh, there are also protests uh, that are el eligibility, eligibility appeals, uh, where if you've been determined ineligible for award, uh, you can challenge that to the small business program as well. So lots of different grounds to protest uh, at the SBA, and uh, I'm sure we could spend an entire webinar talking about that, but I think we are out of time. Uh, next slide. And we're out of content, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Uh, and if you have any questions, anybody you have any questions about this part of the webinar or this uh, part, please contact our speakers with the contact information you see on the screen. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you so much for joining us today. This concludes today's webinar.